Hello and welcome back to Unheard. On Friday, the UK Court of Appeal rejected the case of Shamima Begum to have her British citizenship reinstated. This is the 15-year-old schoolgirl, as she was then, who ran away in 2015 to join Islamic State, or ISIL. She married a jihadi and bore three children, none of whom survive. In 2019, the then Home Secretary, Sajid Javid, revoked her UK citizenship on the grounds that she was also technically Bangladeshi, so she wouldn't be rendered stateless, and that she was a danger to the nation. She's been fighting it ever since. So, is this judgment a victory for common sense? Or is it actually show justice? that we should be ashamed of. Well, former Supreme Court Justice and friend of the show, Jonathan Sumption, one of the great legal minds of his generation, feels like the right person to ask. Welcome, Jonathan. Hello. What's your reaction? Do you think we should have allowed Shamima Begin to retain British citizenship or do you support the decision? Well, legally, nothing in the Court of Appeals judgment surprised me at all. Uh, Their main argument was that because Shamima Begum had been trafficked uh, for sexual purposes, um, she should not have uh, been deprived of her citizenship. The problem about that is that the Home Secretary deprived her of citizenship because he took the view that she was a threat to national security. It's a power that he's got. Um, And it seems pretty clear that you can be uh, trafficked Uh, for sexual purposes and still be a threat to national security. We don't know why she was thought to be a threat to national security. Um, The the Home Secretary and indeed to some extent the courts have relied on uh, confidential uh, uh, intelligence assessments which have quite properly not been disclosed. Um, So um, we have to take their word for it. Personally, I find it surprising. Uh, It seems to me uh, that um, uh, uh, the the follies of a 15-year-old school child must be redeemable. Uh, it also seems pretty clear that since she is probably uh, the best-known person in the world in her particular position, um, she would be the last person uh, to be used as a way of disrupting the British state. Um, but, you know, these are not my well-informed comments. I do not know what was in the intelligence dossier. Um, The real uh, problem here seems to me not to be a problem for the courts at all. It's a problem about the law. Uh, The law says that the Home Secretary cannot deprive a person of citizenship if it would make them stateless. Now, statelessness is treated perfectly correctly as a purely legal concept. But realistically, it isn't. Um, uh, Sarima Begum could be deprived of her British citizenship because, in theory, she had Bangladeshi citizenship. There are lots of countries in the world that impose citizenship on people under their own law without their knowledge or consent, uh, sometimes completely arbitrarily. Um, And Sharmima Begum was technically a Bangladeshi citizen until she was 21 years old because her parents were born in Bangladesh, and that's what the law of Bangladesh says. Uh, But her Bangladeshi citizenship was actually a legal fiction. Uh, She'd never been to Bangladesh. She wasn't born there. Uh, She had absolutely no connection with Bangladesh. And the Bangladeshi government has made it clear that they wouldn't allow her to enter the country. Um, So, uh, frankly, her Bangladeshi citizenship was an empty legal husk. It meant absolutely nothing. So you think she has been rendered effectively stateless today? Well, she has. There's there's no doubt about that. Uh, Until she was 21, she was effectively stateless uh, because um, her Bangladeshi citizenship meant nothing. Once she was 21, her Bangladeshi citizenship lapsed. um, And so she's now completely stateless, both in fact and in law. So what's really happened is that the Home Secretary has deprived her of the only citizenship that mattered in any realistic sense, uh, because she was a a citizen, uh, had another citizenship, which frankly had no reality at all. So let's just unpick a couple of those arguments. Had you been persuaded that she was a real and present danger to national security, would you, in that scenario, support her losing her citizenship? Yes. 
um, provided that there was that this was a state of affairs that there was reason to think would continue. Even if she would be rendered stateless in the process? Yes. I don't see why um, uh, the, the Home Secretary uh, should accept the, the, the continued citizenship of somebody who is a threat to the security of the UK. I am sceptical about whether that was actually the case. So really, that's the crucial question in your mind, is, is whether that... And we'll never see the evidence, so we're all speculating in a way. Well, there, there's a bit more to it than that, because the Home Secretary can't uh, make somebody stateless, however bad their threat uh, to the UK. Um, and the problem is that he has effectively made her stateless, not in law, but in practice so that anybody who cares about the reality of the situation as opposed to legal formulae uh, should be concerned about this. So the whole business of whether or not she was trafficked, do you think that was just a bad defence and she should have hired you instead because they picked the wrong argument? Well, um, people in a desperate position can't be too choosy about the arguments that they use. Um, uh, What was being argued was that the Home Secretary... uh, had a duty to investigate the question whether she had or hadn't been trafficked. And this was the the, the peg on which they were going to hang the the idea that in order to investigate that properly and give effect to the law against trafficking, he had to bring her back to the UK. Of course, the Home Secretary was never going to do that because once she's in the UK, uh, it would be pretty well impossible to deport her, um, citizen or no citizen. Um, so in that that was the argument. It it seems to me to be pretty feeble, but I'm the last person who is going to criticise those who have very little um, weaponry in their lockers uh, for doing the best they can. And just to finish on the on the sort of technical legal aspects, as I understand it, this whole case re- rested on a prior decision by the Supreme Court that the case could go ahead without her being there. And there was another controversy about that. Uh, Do you support that earlier? Uh, Yes, I do, because um, the the argument was that she couldn't effectively instruct her lawyers or or bring her appeal if she wasn't physically present in the UK. I mean, that's just factually nonsense. Um, Litigation, even complex litigation, even public law litigation, can be and very often is conducted at a distance. Um, uh, So... Uh, essentially, this feels like a device to bring her back to the UK, given that it would then be pretty well impossible to uh, to remove her. What's interesting to me is that actually on those big legal questions, you support the direction of travel. She, we could have tried her like this. It is theoretically possible not to give her citizenship, even if it rendered her effectively stateless. It all comes down to really more of an overall sense of the rights and wrongs of the case. That is my position. I do not think that the decision of the Home Secretary uh, can be faulted in law for all the reasons that the Court of Appeal explained in their pretty comprehensive judgment this morning. Uh, What I do think, however, is that the law has given the Home Secretary the power to commit a gross injustice, and he has chosen to do that. Other Home Secretaries might not have done. Do you think it's something to do with this sense that a a citizenship should be a a sort of sacred possession? Um, That actually, once you've been let in, as it were, or if you're born here, or if you have a British passport, it shouldn't be a reasonable measure to suddenly withdraw it. Is that that where the injustice lies? That's, That's not where I start from. I mean, the fact is the law says you can withdraw it if it is... Uh, to use the statutory phrase, um, conducive to the public good to withdraw it. Uh, and I don't have any problem with the with the principle. Uh, I do think that it is such a drastic power um, that the Home Secretaries should always be exceptionally cautious before exercising it. So if it's the public good argument, what about the argument that sh- surely, just as an example to other people who might be considering becoming traitors to their country, absconding, 
joining a murderous regime that wishes ill to to our own country. This now makes it quite clear that uh, it's not allowed. And if you do that, you won't be allowed back. Is that not a public good? (laughs) Yes, I think it is. And you've got to weigh up, however, different um, public goods. One public good is, is, is a basic sense of justice. I mean, because she committed an act of gross folly at the age of 15, she is now condemned uh, to be unable to go anywhere in the world except in the uh, uh, Kurdish-run detention centre where she has been for the last few years. Now, uh, that is a situation which seems likely to persist permanently. Now, I think some sense of proportion should be brought to this, uh, even if one is interested in deterring others. Um, And to my mind, uh, condemning somebody to effect permanent uh, exile uh, in an unfriendly corner of northern Syria is a grossly disproportionate response uh, to the act of somebody who was only 15 when she took this fateful decision. I suspect what some people watching might think is that this is another overly observant to the rules kind of argument made by uh, Western powers that seem in it, unable to defend themselves from things that are most common sense people would think are, are bad, such as terrorists and such as people who are evidently traitors. And yet here we are finding ways to defend her, finding ways to let her back in. What would you say to those people who are like, come on, Lord Sumption, you know, this is now angels on the head of a pin. She, she went to the Islamic State. She witnessed murders. She took part in violence. She was part of an absolute enemy country. Why would we want her back? Well, um, that's one point of view. It's not a point of view that I share uh, because of her age at the time uh, and because I believe uh, that um, people who commit this sort of act at the age of 15 are redeemable. Now, I accept that I've not seen the intelligence material any more than you have or anyone else has, apart from the Home Secretary of the Courts. Um, but you know, it, it seems to me that uh, a basic observation about human nature suggests that it's very unlikely to be the case that this young woman uh, is incapable mm-hmm. of, of being redeemed. Thought experiment. If it had gone the other way, she had had citizenship restored and she was now on a plane about to land in Gatwick. What would happen to her on return? Would do, would you recommend that she was now prosecuted in British courts for some kind of crime? Or would she then be writing memoirs that published in the, the news agents? What, what, what do you expect would happen? She has committed uh, serious criminal offences by joining ISIS. And she could be prosecuted for those. And I would have thought should be if she came back. Um I don't have a problem about that. And that is, that's actually what most countries have done. Most countries have repatriated uh, their misguided citizens, mostly young, who went off and joined ISIS uh, before ISIS collapsed. And so, you know, it is for all that you say about um, uh, uh, deterrence and treachery and all that, and you know, I can concede the force of those points, um, there are other ways of dealing with this. You're very well known for recently having come out against the European Court of Human Rights. It's a completely separate issue, but I think in people's minds it will be a sort of cousin of this question in that it once again pits our sort of national self-interest against complex international legal frameworks, which, and there's a question of which we have a prior allegiance to. Is it rules about statelessness and rules about international law? Or should we be a bit more rough and ready and just defend the national interest? On the ECHR question, you've you've taken a, a different course and you seem to think that those courts are overly politicised and no longer represent the British interest. But you, you, you take a different view on this question. There's no inconsistency because the rule which empowers the Home Secretary to deprive her of her citizenship is a rule of English statute law with the limitations that English statute law imposes. Um, uh, this isn't a, 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 a position that I'm taking uh, a, a, on account of any kind of international norm. It simply seems to me to be a basic 
principle of justice in the broader non-legal sense. Um, ministers often have powers to do unjust things, to do things that wiser ministers might not do. And I think a wiser minister than Chavid would probably have taken a different line. Another separate but possibly related question has happened in the last couple of days, which is the whole business of the Speaker of the House of Commons ripping up precedent, apparently because he was anxious about protesters and threats to MP security related to Israel Gaza. Where do you stand on that? I find it bizarre to suggest that the procedural rules about which of uh, which uh, motion is going to take priority uh, should have any impact at all on the safety of MPs. Um, I believed that this speaker's predecessor, John Burke, for all his vices, and there were plenty of those, uh, actually did the country a considerable service by not allowing uh, a government which did not have a majority in the House of Commons uh, to uh, determine exactly what the House of Commons should consider. That was the view that I expressed, and it's one that I still hold. Um, I think that Speaker Hoyle's decision uh, about the debate the day before yesterday comes into a different category entirely. Um, uh, there are circumstances, and minority governments is one of them, when it's, it's right to modify the rules to an unusual situation. But what Speaker Hoyle did uh, was, to, was to deprive the Scottish National Party uh, of their right to bring forward and vote upon their own motion. Uh, opposite, the government has most of the cards in House of Commons procedure. One of the few exceptions to that is that opposition parties uh, are entitled to opposition days when they determine the agenda, they put forward the motion that they want to put forward. Um, the Scottish National Party has fewer opposition days than the Labour Party because it's a smaller party. Um, and it has effectively uh, uh, been deprived of those by a decision on the part of the Speaker, which enabled the Labour Party to hijack their opposition day. Uh, I think that that is a, a, a serious matter. And although there's all sorts of tactical shenanigans going on, uh, the, the, the Scottish National Party was trying to set a trap to the Labour Party so as to encourage rebellions, which they hoped would reduce the impact electoral impact of the Labour Party in Scotland. The Labour Party wanted to avoid the appearance of a schism which in fact exists. The Conservative Party was very happy uh, to see them uh, all fighting each other uh, uh, all to its own good. Uh, I am not in any of these camps, but I do care about the effectiveness of the House of Commons. And it seems to me that what Speaker Hoyle did uh, undermined its effectiveness in quite a significant way. Does it worry you also that this sense that you know there was a big protest over the road in Parliament Square, they were beaming from the river to the sea up the length of Big Ben. Apparently, certain Labour MPs had received threats to their safety. Does it worry you that there was that sense of intimidation that brought about that change to procedure? Well, if indeed it did, um, uh, I think that I, I don't... I, I don't know how real the threat is, and I don't know how real it is to suggest that the threat was increased uh, by determining whether it was the SNP's motion critical of Israel or the Labour Party's motion slightly less critical of Israel, which took priority. I just think these are two unconnected facts. But the answer to your question, does it concern me that there should be threats, that there should be an atmosphere of violence? Yes, of course it does, and it should concern anybody but I don't think it's got anything to do with the procedural decisions of the Speaker of the House of Commons. Final question, Lord Sunshine. A lot of people who've been watching this channel will have become big fans of yours during the uh, COVID um, period. And you were so much of an outlier there and you, you really stuck to your guns on the lockdowns were a mistake. Tracing your viewpoints through, we now reach where you've come down on the Shamima Begum case. It's, I guess, more of a... Well, I think I'm an outlier on that too. Um, I, I suspect that I am. But, you know, I don't do portfolio politics. Uh, I don't take the line that because I think something about issue X, I've got to think uh, uh, something about some unrelated issue Y. I try to look at each 
problem on its merits. Well, I was going to accuse you of coherence, actually, because... <laughs> well, that's that's welcome. I, I feel guilty to coherence. The thread that unites them is a sort of respect for liberalism in the technical sense, that it was thrown out during the COVID era. And in the case of Shamima Begum, you don't go around just denying people passports on the whim of the Home Secretary. That doesn't feel proper. Is that? Do you think that's a coherent thread? I, I think that's that's perfectly fair. I mean, uh, I am a liberal, and uh, that is a common feature in quite a lot of the views that I take on public affairs. That means proper institutions, proper procedures, and following some rules. Respect for uh, conventions when those conventions are still relevant. Sometimes they have ceased to be relevant when one allows them to expire. But we're not in that. But we're not in that area now. And liberty being a big part of that. Liberty is not an absolute value. It can be trumped. But it needs something really important to trump it. Lord Sumption, thanks for giving us the benefit of your wisdom today. Thank you. Always good to hear from Jonathan Sumption, a real friend of the show and a independent thinker, just the kind of person we love here at Unheard. Whether you agree with him or not, let us know. And thanks for joining. This was Unheard.